So we just finished talking about vectors as one of the classes that you can store your data in. In this set of slides, we're going to talk some about another structure called data frames. And these really are ones that kind of build on that idea of a vector. So you might have noticed as we were looking through the vectors that we had in our examples, ones that were all of the same length and all kind of applied across the same three characters, uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. So we can look at those and now for right now, just look at how these are placed. So they, they've kind of been taken from strings and rotated around. So we've got that name one. Um, we could do a last name. We've got the number of kids and whether they survive to a certain point in the book. So when you have a case like that, where you have several vectors that are all the same length and where a certain position in one corresponds to a certain position in another, just like the first position in each of these corresponds to Harry going across and the second to Ron, then you can store them together in an object class called a data frame. And this is really a kind of two dimensional class that lets you put in vectors where you've got the same data type within everything in a column, but then stick them alongside other ones where some of the other columns might include information that's a different data type. So I, I've written this down here, but you really can think of a data frame as combining one or more vectors that are of the same length and where a certain order in one corresponds to the order in another. And then those are just stuck together side by side. So here are a few elements that you'll want to know in terms of names of, of, of features of these data frames. Um, each of these is a column. These are, again, kind of the, those original vectors stuck together. Each of those will get a column name, and we'll use this column name to refer to that column as we work with the data frame, just like we use object names to refer to an object later. And then finally, going down, we've got rows. And again, each of those is corresponding, in this case, to an observation to one of the characters who shows up in that book. In this class, as I've mentioned earlier, we'll be focusing a lot on the tidyverse or the tidy approach to data analysis in R. So we'll be working with a specific class of data frame called a tibble. It's very similar to the data frame in BASAR. It's just got a few features that, that make it work a little bit more nicely and, and easier sometimes, I think. So you can create a new data frame using a function called tibble from a package of the same name. And we'll look through some examples of doing that. But I think it is important to point out that often you will not be creating these by hand, you'll be reading them in. Next week we will talk a whole lot about how to read data into R and a lot of times we'll be reading it into this data frame structure. So if you're creating this by hand, uh, you'll first need to load the tipple package. If you don't have it installed already, you'll need to install it with the install.packages that we covered in an earlier set of slides. Then this is the generic code showing you the structure. So we'll have the tipple call and then inside of that, we'll list these pairs separated by an equal. And so for each pair, it'll start with what we want the name for the column to be and then the equal sign and after that, what we want in that column. And this will often be a vector assignment with that C, that concatenate function that we covered in the last set of slides. And then we'll separate each of those pairs for each separate column by a comma as we build it up. If we want to save this data frame to use it later, we'll need to use the gets arrow and assign it to a name just like we did with the vectors when we wanted to use those later. So here's an example and I'll actually go over into our studio for this and I've already set some of this up in a script. So I'll run the call to load the tipple package so we'll have access to all the functions there. So here I'm going to create a data frame called HP data for Harry Potter data and use tipple. And you can see that we've got this kind of like paired up structure of what we want the column name to be and then an equal sign and then a vector of what we want in the column. And you can see for each of those, we're using that concatenate function, the C to create the vector. 
So I can highlight one of these and run that, and you can come down and see that that's created the vector with those three values. We can come and look at this one for the end kids and run that, and you can see that that's working as well. So when we run this all together, it will put those together in a data frame, and now when we print it out, you can see that it's got that two-dimensional structure just like we were looking at in the slides. So if you've already created some of these vectors, you can just stick those together by using those names. Again, um, anytime you've named an object, you can reference that in later code using the name instead of needing to go back and, and reassign everything. So before we looked at the example of creating a vector called main characters and a vector called in kids, we can come down here again and look and convince ourselves that the first one has the name of the characters and the second has the numbers that we want. And then when we do the tipple call in the piece of code that I've done here lower, we can replace these sections where we want to use the same values with the object name. So on the right hand side here, instead of defining a vector as I did up here, I'm referencing the vector that I already created. So again, instead of doing this process of writing your own data frame or even correct it, creating it from vectors, usually you will be reading in data from somewhere else. Um, so this is an example. I'm not going to go deeply into it right now because we're going to cover this a whole lot next week. But if you have data in a comma separated value format, a CSV format, you can use the read underscore CSV function from the reader package. And this is taking a whole very large file of data and bringing it in as a data frame where we can work with it. When we do ls now, if you'll remember, that's how we can list all the objects that we've named in our current R session. You'll see that daily show is showing up, that we've got that data frame in our R session now. There are a few nice functions that you can use to explore a data frame. First of all, you might want to know the dimensions of it. How many rows and how many columns does it have? There's a function DIM, a DIM, that stands for dimension. If you run that using as the argument the object name for your data frame, it will give you first the number of rows and then the number of characters. So we can see in this, this um, example where we read in data from um, a CSV that it's got five columns, but then over 2,500 rows. If you want just one of those values, there's an n row function that stands for the number of rows, and then an n column function that stands for the number of columns. There are also a few other functions in BASAR that are really helpful for exploring data frames, especially if you've read in one that was really big for another source. STR stands for structure, and that shows you a bit about the structure of a data frame or any other R object, really. And then summary will give you a summary of each of the columns that you have in that data frame. So we can take a look here and do str with HP data. So with that structure, you can see that it's listed each of the column names that we had, some information about the data type in that column, so character, character, numeric, and logic. This is giving us the number of values that are there, so each of these have three values, and then it lists some of the first few values that we have. If this were a larger data set with more rows, it would only show the first few because it's only got three rows that's showing us the whole thing right now. And then we can look at summary as well. And you can see now it's broken it down in a different way by each of the column names. For those that are characters, it tells us how long it is and that it is a character. But then for some of the others, like uh, the numeric and, and, and um, logical, it gives us a bit more information. So for numeric, it gives us some information about the minimum, maximum, median, and mean. And then for survived, it counts up the number that we have in true and false. In this case, they were all true, so it just tells us that there were three in true.
the last thing that I want to talk about with data frames right now is how you can pull out values. Once you have a data frame, if you only want to get a small part of it, how can you extract that from the full large data frame? We will look later about lots of clever ways that you can do this with logic. For example, filtering just to rows that meet certain conditions or, or columns with certain patterns in the name. For right now, I'm just going to focus on a very mechanical way to do this. If you know that there's a certain section of the data frame you want to pick out and extract uh, based on which columns it falls in, the number of those, and which rows it falls in. So we're going to look at two functions here. And the key difference between the two is whether you are trying to extract rows or whether you are trying to extract columns. Slice is what we'll use to extract rows and select for columns. Both of these are from the dplyr package, which is part of the tidyverse. So here's an example. Say that you wanted to get just the first two rows of the HP data data frame, the example one that we just looked at. You can use slice to do that. And the convention is that for the first argument, you put in the name of the, the um, tibble, the data frame, that you want to take. And then for the second one, you put in a, a, a numerical value and that can be either a single value or it can be a vector with different values. So you put that in and this says which of those rows you want to pull. So again, this will evaluate to the numbers one and two, a vector with one and two. So th this is saying with the HP data, I want to slice out the first two rows, rows one and two. And you can see when you run that, that that's what we get. We get this limited just to the first two rows. Select works in a really similar way, but instead of slicing out certain rows, it's going to slice out certain columns for us. So again, we'll say the HP data. In this case, I'm showing an example that we want to get the first and the fourth columns. So the numeric vector here, the one where we're specifying the positions, this evaluates to one and four. And then when we run that in select, you can see that we're picking out just the first and fourth columns. And as a note, we talked in earlier slides about how you can compose calls from different functions to make a longer expression where R will evaluate the ones that are inside first and then work its way out. So you can do that here. If you wanted to pick out a, just a subset of, of a data frame where you're both limiting the number of rows and columns, you can compose these together. So in this case, in the inside, I'm running slice to pick out the first two rows and then that's surrounded by select. So the output of slice now has gone into that first position for the specifying the data frame um, for the select call. 